And then we started on combined gas law. All right, and this is like I told you, like the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. They all put all their gas laws together to make one gigantic law. Okay, so you got Boyle's law. We got Charles' law, and we got gay lussacs law. When you overlap them all together, you get the combined gas law. Technically, guys, you could just use this one law for all three if you know how to use it. Uh, if something's kept constant, though, you just remove it as a variable. That's uh -huh. it. And I already showed you all how to do that. Yeah. All right, now let's actually work out some of these samples. So you got this problem right here. Again, I like this formula. Now, on your formula sheet, the first one I give you is it kind of already crisscrossed. I'm going to recommend you, and I, that's why I then rewrote it like this. Again, I like this a lot better because you put everything before on one side, everything after on the other. The way you solve it is the same way you do Charles' Law. You just crisscross multiply. You just got a couple more variables that you got to go with. So let's do a couple samples real fast. A sample of gas has a volume of 283 milliliters at 25 degrees C and 600 millimeters of mercury pressure. What will the volume be at STP? Okay, first off. Go ahead and outline your variables. Now, again, I'm going to let you write on the test because that seems to help out. Uh -huh. This is a volume. Okay, let's say that's our first volume. This is a temperature. There's our T1. And here is a pressure. Let that be our P1. What will the volume be? We're trying to find our V2 at STP. The one thing I told you all to memorize that you have to know for this test that will not be on the formula chart is STP. What is standard temperature and pressure? Two things. All right, the 273 Kelvin, is that temperature or is that pressure? Temperature. That is temperature. Okay, so there's our T2. And what was the, what is the pressure then? 22.4. Uh-uh. Just kidding. Uh, four. One ATM. You have to know them both, guys. I might ask you for standard pressure. I might ask you for standard temperature. I might ask you for both. This is one of those where I'm going to ask you at both. Now, I do know some people are saying, well, wait a minute. Uh, last unit we said STP was 22.4 liters. What changed? Um, okay, now do realize when you look back at that, that's one mole of gas is equal to 22.4 liters. Do you see anything talking about moles up here? No. So please, on the test, I'm going to go ahead and tell you. If you see 22.4, don't put it down. Just don't. Okay, don't, that's, don't, don't, just don't do it. Okay, you're going to hurt yourself. All right. All right? Okay. All right. You all right there? All right. Okay, sling blade. All right. So now all we got to do is just plug everything in. So let's plug everything in. Now, however, before we start plugging everything in, let's double check something here. We know our standard temperature is at K, okay? So we need this guy to be at K also. Well, we just can't plug in 25. What else you got to do to it? Yeah. All right. So let's turn, <laughs> 273 plus 25 is what? 200, what was it? You do have a calculator, right? 298. Okay, all right, so there's our, uh, our other temperature. Um, okay, so we put in our 298, uh, we put that in, da, da, da. Okay, so what else do we got here? Can we go ahead and plug in this volume? Yep. Yes. Yeah, they, they say they want a volume in a certain unit. No, so what is that, when we solve for this X, what unit is that volume going to be in? It's going to be in milliliters, okay? So we can't go ahead and plug that in. Now the last guy that we got to plug in is this. Can we just plug in the 600? No. Nope. Uh -huh. That's ATM. That's yeah. millimeters mercury. we got to make them the same. So we got to do some conversion. 760 milliliters. Now, did you memorize that, or did you, act, did you read it off? Memorize it, man. See, that's, that's one of the units that y'all can't memorize. So how many, uh, in one ATM, how many millimeters of mercury? One well, I already said it, didn't I? Sure did. So I basically divide, you're going to end up with a decimal. 600 divided by 760? 0.79. I knew it was 0.7. 0.79? Yes. Okay, cool. That's what we're looking at. Okay. I take this times all three of these. Okay, so you could put this times this times that. All right, that's on one side of your equation. Okay, well then how do we get x by itself? Divide. Divide. What did you say? 81. 81. And what units is that? Milliliters. Milliliters. 
So when you do see these guys, be careful. I will, if you hear me say STP instead of standard temperature or standard pressure, you probably got an ideal gas law or combined gas law problem. I will tell you, you'll get a question just like this. And uh, usually if they ask you combined gas law, they'll want it STP. They can say, hey, put it at these other units if they want. It'll still work out. But uh, to make a quick and easy question, that'll go down. Notice the volume is not at 22.4 liters, okay? Because remember, that one is based on how many moles. We didn't put moles in this. So don't get that confusion. You really shouldn't ever get that as an answer in here. <laughs> All right, so Dalton's law, this is the silly law, but I got to go over it. There is, I can make this law more difficult, but I'm not going to because that gets more into uh, AP Kim stuff. Uh, so anyway, Dalton's law basically says this. You do need to know his law. It's a sum, he basically says the sum of the partial pressures equal a total pressure in a mixture. Um, what the, he's basically saying is add up all the individual pressures of a gases of all the different gases in there they're all going to equal a total number <laughs> they're going to give off a total pressure in other words what i'm saying is this um i'm going to zoom in here and I'll, I'll jump back in a second all these guys are in uh i think millimeters of mercury uh no 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 they're in pascals okay they're kilopascals but if you take a look at this this is our atmosphere these are all the gases in our atmosphere right now. So there is oxygen that you're breathing right now, nitrogen, argon, so a little bit of water in the air, and CO2, because you're exhaling CO2. This is all what's in the air right now, okay? Each of them give off a specific pressure. What Dalton is saying is if you take all their individual pressures, add them up, you get a total pressure. 101. That's it. That's all we're getting at? That, that's it. That's then what? Cool. So why, why, why do I need to talk about it? Because it can get more difficult. I ain't none of this going but happen. what I'm trying to say is this. Uh, how questions I'm going to ask you could be, well, well I'll show you three examples and you're going to probably like, this is stupid. Like I said, you're going to be like, why? But here's the thing. People miss these on the test because they forget to study his law. They forget, oh, what was it again? They all add up. That's all you need to know. Uh, so you might want to put a special note to go back and study these guys. There's no worksheet for this. Okay, these are, I'm going to give you three examples, that's it. But if, in other words, how could I ask you a question? If I gave you one, two, three, four, not this one, and then I gave you the total, could you figure out what the pressure CO2 was? Sure. Yeah, you add all these up, subtract from the total. That's it. If I said find me the total pressure, all you had to do was add these up. That's it. No curveball. No jump scare. So, uh, I'll show you an example. You want to see examples? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do examples. All right, so here's an example. I'm going to give you three examples. Uh, but anyway, okay, so what is the atmospheric pressure? What is atmospheric pressure? 101.3, oh, never mind, JK. Uh, ATM. ATM, okay, they want it in units of ATM. If the partial pressures of, now partial means each one's a partial, Okay, nitrogen gas, oxygen gas, and argon are as follows. 604.5, 162.8, and 0.5 millimeters of mercury. In other words, these are all your partial pressures. They want to know what the total pressures is. So you got two things you got to do here. Okay. Now, first off, they have to be an ATM. And second off, you just need to add them together. But the easiest way to do this one is to add these all together. Are they all the same unit? Yeah. That means they can all be added together. So go ahead and add them up. Sorry. Seven what? 0.8. So that's your total. And I usually say PT there. Um, so that's your total pressure. Now they just want an ATM. So I, what do you got to do? Divide by 760. And if you forgot your uh, ratio, it's on that formula sheet. That gives you one ATM. I'll just do that. And it looks like 1.01. Mm -hmm. I just did that in my head. How do you know that? I just look, this can go in there one time, and I know there's just a little bit, so I kind of guessed it's either going to be 1.01 or 1.02. I guessed. No, I just guessed. It's, there's, there's just guessing. Uh, that's it. Uh, we'll get to him. All right, so next one. There is a mixture of three gases. A, B, C. This is so... Okay. 
But people miss this on the test. I don't know why. Uh, there's a mixture of three gases, A, B, C. Okay? If A, the total pressure, okay? Why are you screaming? The total pressure total. is 15. Okay? Gas A oh my God. exerts 5 ATM. Okay? Gas B exerts. Four. Okay. What then? How much pressure does C exert then? It's got to be 12. Six. I got to hold this up. So it's six. <laughs> Why is it six? Okay. Well, here's the thing. I'll add up to the total, right? So here's your total. You're basically subtracting A and B from the total. In other words, this two added together is nine, right? Well, what's nine minus 15? Six. C then would equal six ATM. Because if you add them all together, five plus four plus six, I mean six plus four is ten, plus five, that's fifteen. Is that fifteen? <laughs> Y'all gotta deal with ideal gas also, it's something else. Last one. Now we got this is probably the hardest one I can give you. But again, percent sign. Before you even begin, you need to think, what is the formula for percent? Part over whole times 100 gives you percent. Now I'll start looking at your question. Okay, a mixture contains 30% helium, 70% hydrogen. When you add the 30 plus the 70, what do you get? 100. Is that a total? That's a total. Uh, what is the partial pressure of hydrogen? Okay, which one of these is hydrogen? No. Okay, there we go. So this is our t pressure, the oh. one we're looking at. Uh, if the total pressure is 3.8 atm, total, which means this is our whole. So guess what? It's just a percent problem. It's not really a Dalton's law problem, but they can form it exactly the same way. So we're trying to find basically our part, which is right here. Okay, times 100. So we got our percent, which is 70. And our total pressure is 3.8. In the end, you're basically taking 0.7 times 3.8. Because if you move this over, guess what's going to happen? That's going to end up being 0.7. And then you cross multiply. And then you end up with what, 2.6? Yeah, 2.66. 66. Oh, I was off by one. Now, that's the partial pressure for hydrogen. Okay, what if I were to ask the partial pressure for helium? Man, you just back it on up in there and... Well, if they said helium, you would plug in 30 instead of that. Or, since you already know this, what could you subtract this from to figure out the other half? You just reverse that and 3.8, man. 3.8. You just subtract that from 3.8. Yeah, man. Oh, Jesus. All right, so here's your form for ideal gas law. I like to call this Pivner. Now, uh, let me explain something about this. This is under ideal conditions, okay? Do we have ideal conditions? Like normal, like right now, is now an ideal condition? I mean, yeah. No, no, it's not. Uh, so basically, we pretend that if it is under ideal conditions, then we can get a good answer for everything. And this is what we base everything on. What's an ideal uh, Perfect scenario, perfect pressure, perfect temperature, perfect everything. It's not fluctuating. Right now, the pressure and the temperature is fluctuating. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, it doesn't stay the same uh, because there's too many variables. So what we do, we try to pretend if it was under that perfect condition, this is the formula we're going to use. So guess what? P is still the same. V is still the same. T is still the same. Pressure, volume, temperature. Okay. The N and R is something a little bit different. We did talk about N earlier, but now we're going to, this is the only formula that has N involved. This is moles. So we, if it's not moles, we got to put in moles. And then there's the R. What is this stinking little R? Well, the R that I'm talking about is right here at the bottom. The ideal gas constant. Guess what? that'll always be this number. You never have to find them. It's already been done for you. I'll show you exactly how we came up with this number. It's under that STP thing all again. Um, but basically, if you took volume, pressure, amount, and temperature, if you remember back at the unit one, I mean not unit one, back in the beginning of this unit, we talked about those four variables. Well, these are all what happens when you combine them all together. When we put them all under ideal conditions, this is our constant. And I'll show you exactly how we got that number. 
Um, but here's the thing. Unlike the other ones, you have to, have to have them in a particular unit. You don't have a choice. Okay? Right. I want you to understand that. There's no making like units. There's you putting it in ATM, always. Now, Boyle's Law, Charles Law, gay lucics Law, Combined Gas Law, Dalton's Law, you didn't have to do all that. Okay, but here, you got to. You don't have a choice. Okay, you cannot plug in milliliters. You cannot plug in TOR. You can't plug in millimeters of mercury. You can't plug in C. We never have. Everything has to be in the following units. Your P has to be an ATM. Your V has to be an L. Your amount has to be in moles. And your T has to be in K. People forget to plug them in like this. And if you forget, I'll have that as an answer choice on the test and you're going to miss it. All right, so let's do this. Three examples, 20 each one. Let's go through each one. I'm going to do the first one with you. No, then the next one I'm going to let you work don't on. don't want you to. Yeah, T. No, don't. What temperature, which that's our T, a sample of carbon dioxide if 5 liters, that's our volume, at 3.7 ATM holds 2.5 moles. And that's our N. So who are we trying to find? Temperature. So we use our Pivner. Okay. Now, you can do this one or two ways. How I do it, I always just use this one formula, plug everything in. I never worry about rearranging. But for craps and giggles, okay, if we were trying to solve for just T, right, how would we rearrange this equation just to get T by itself and then just plug everything in at once? So if we were going to get T by itself, we need to put this in an R back over here, right? Right. So when we do that, if we solved for just T, the rearranged formula is this. You could do it that way. However, the part that people mess up in, just like last unit, they forget to put it in parentheses. Boop. Boop. Please do not put it all in one line. If you see a divide sign, you're going to multiply everything on top, multiply everything on bottom, and divide the difference. So how would this look like in your calculator? I don't like doing this because it's one shot. You get your whole answer and you knock it out. All right, so let's plug and chuck. First off, let's check our units. Everything has to be in the following. P has to be in ATM. Volume has to be in liters. Uh, T has to be in K. And the N has to be in moles. All right, has to, has to, has to, has to, has to. All right, so we don't, we're trying to find our temperature. Volume is in liters, check. Okay, so we're good here. All right, does that have to be an ATM? It is an ATM, we're good there. And our amount is in moles, is that in moles? Yeah. So everything else is good. Now the question is, well, what about our R? Well, again, that R will always be this one number that you have right there, that zero, 0.0821 every single time. I've actually memorized it because I use it so much. So what we do now is plug everything in and you're fine. Times five divided by open parentheses 2.5 times 0 0.0821 close parentheses. <laughs> 177.83. All right, so that was easy because he didn't have to convert. Let's do one where you have to convert. Because I'm not going to give you one like this on the test. That's too freaking easy. Booga, 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 booga. All right. So how many grams? Ooh, we got to convert this to grams. Okay. So grams is related to what? Mass. Moles. No, daggone. It is mass. Yeah. So this is going to be our N. We're trying to find N. Oxygen at, by the way, this is going to be important here in a little bit because that's O2. All right, we'll come back to that. Uh, 100 degrees C, that is going to be our temperature? Temperature. Okay. Well, we already know we need to go ahead and put that at K. So Oxygen let's. Seven, three. There we go. 300. Knock that puppy out. Let's move on. Does it take to fill 1,000 milliliters? That is a volume. However, cannot be in milliliters. Got to be in liters. So move the decimal over three times. That's one liter. Okay. Flask of a pressure of this guy. Now, this one you probably can't do in your head. 
1.5? So. What do we have to convert that to? Um, well, what is the units it has to be in? So you need to... That's G. 760. Oh, man. Hold on. Hold on. It is 1.5? Yes. Yes. 1.5 atom or ATM. All right. So now we got that guy. 1.5 ATM. So now, here's the thing. We have our P. Boop, boop. We have our V. Boop, boop. We don't have our N. Boop, boop. We do have our R. We'll always have that. And then we also have our T. The only thing that we're trying to solve for is our N. So you can plug everything just like you see it, or we can go ahead and rearrange the equation and make it easy on ourselves. So how do we get N by itself? We divide RT by both sides, and you end up with PV over RT. This one, 1.5. I'm sorry, did I not put P up here? There we go. There's my P. <laughs> yeah, you do. What'd you get? 0 0.049 moles. Okay. Now, that's not our final answer, though. I know, it is right. However, this is moles of, remember I told you they want it in grams? What is the element? Oxygen. So, guess what? Convert. Got to convert. So, one mole of O2 weighs how many grams? Two oxygens. 32. 32. So, moles of O2 cancel out. You're basically multiplied by this. And you get your final answer, which I believe is somewhere around five. 1.5. Five, seven. So let's do one where I give you very little information, but I actually give you everything you need to know. Ooh. <laughs> okay, so what is the volume? So, all right, don't freak out. Um, okay, so what is the volume? So let's go ahead. We're solving for this guy right here, okay? So we do have our P, our N, our, our R, and our T. You don't realize it, but you do have it. They do tell you two of the values right here. What is STP? One ATM, man. All right, and... So there's two values right there. All right. Uh, we already know our R. That's always going to be there. You'll never have to find him. And uh, so that leaves N here. Well, they give you nine point, sorry, 9.45 grams of C2H2, which y'all remember what that is called, common name? You're close. It does start with an A. Acetylene. Acetylene. That is right. Uh, that's that big combustive stuff they blew up the pumpkin with. I don't have one. I'm sorry. Uh, they took all my moles. So, uh, let's see. You need the mass of this hair thing to turn it into moles. So, you need to know what one mole weighs. Uh, well, 12.1 plus 12.1 plus 1.1 plus 1.1. About 30. <laughs> 12.01 plus 12.01 is 24.02. Okay, that sounds right. Now y'all do this divided by that. You're going to get a decimal. Point three six. Everybody saying three six. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, that's all right. That's our end. So now all we got to do is plug everything in for the missing guy. Um, this is actually a little bit easier when they do say STP. That means that's less conversions you really got to do. That's why I like it. Uh, so how do we get V by itself? Well, divide by P. And when you do that, this cancels out. You got V equals NRT. So your formula is going to take that 0.36 times your R, 0 0.081, yeah. 
times, what was the, t oh yeah, 273. Uh, we are, at, yeah, well, there you go, it's divided by one. What'd you get? 8.07 what? Lily Towers. However, uh, we do got to talk about this before we go in the lab on Wednesday. The ideal gas law is used to predict behavior of gases in uh, ideal conditions. However, because we don't have ideal conditions ever, it's a good approximation, which means it gives us in the ballpark. It's not exact. So we're going to play okay. with a bunch of gases Wednesday? Yeah, we're actually going to play with some lighters. Uh, I'll show you how it works. You're not to light them, obviously. Oh, I know. Uh, it does not work very well at very high pressure and very low temperature. Now, let me ask you this. Think of this. What happens to a gas at very high pressure? Why would it not work? This law not work at very high pressure? Because it gets to moving really fast. Mm, so uh, not really. Huh. It has less space to move around. Okay. What happens if a gas does not have enough space to move around in? What it happens to it? It's it hotter. Okay. It gets more and more compact and turns into a solid. Eventually into a solid, but before then it turns oh, into a liquid. Okay, so here's the thing. You're all right there? Okay. So here's the weird thing. This is called ideal gas behavior. It applies to gases. If it's no longer a gas, it doesn't really apply, does it? That's why lighters turn or liquid. That's why it's liquid and lighter, and that's what y'all are gonna see when y'all get in there. As soon as you open it up, it's like it's a gas coming out. Um, same thing in a propane tank. You hear it sloshing around, it's in a liquid phase because it's so much pressure underneath. Uh, same thing happens at very low temperatures. What happens to gases at low temperatures? They don't move around as much, so therefore they end up getting closer and turning to a different state of matter. So the reason why is because they turn to a liquid. That's the reason why this doesn't work very well at high pressure and very low temperature. They're going between that limit between the two phases. So it really does apply to a good area where we're dealing with just gases, but when we change state of matter, we end up with a problem. All right, so now let me get to where we, we get this R value from. Okay, where did they get this 22.4 liters that we talked about last unit? Well, what they did, they took all gases. Okay, here's a list of oxygen, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen, helium, chlorine, all these gases. They took them all and they put them all at STP, which is 1 atm and 0 degree C. Okay, and by the way, these are all one mole gases. So we have our amount, we have our pressure, we have our temperature, okay? So then they just then solve for their volume every time. They did the same thing y'all been doing, okay? Which y'all just did a second ago. Use the same formula. Uh, and what they did, they found out that the volume was all very, very close together, okay? When you average all these guys together, you get 22.4. That's where they got the volume from. So it's an average number together. On average, this is what uh, one mole of gas does, even though each uh, gas does something a little bit different. Okay, I want that to be pointed out, but they're all very close to 22.4. Um, okay, so then uh, this gets us to our next thing. Where the crap did they get the R from? Okay, well, let's do this. The, you don't have to do this on the test, but this does help out understanding the formula. Um, so we got PV equals NRT, right? All right. If we were to solve for R, what would the formula look like? Uh, All right. So PV divided by NT. That would give us R, right? Or you flip it around, don't matter. All right. So we need a pressure, we need a volume, we need an amount, and we need a temperature. Well, guess what? What's our amount? One mole. So let me plug all this in. All right. What's our temperature? Okay, um, what was our pressure? 760, which is one ATM. And what, uh, we need our volume. Well, on average it's 22.4, right? Uh. So how did they come up with their R? Take uh, 22.4 divided by 273. Do it in your calculator real quick. You're taking 22.4 basically divided by 273. 1.08. Is this the number you got? Yeah. Is that the R value that's on your sheet? Uh-huh. Yeah. 
This is what we call a constant. This is great because if we know a constant is something we can compare it to. It's a lot like a, creating a ruler. Imagine you never having a ruler before, but you had to create one out of the blue. What standard would you put it to? Well, this is now a standard. That's why it's always 8, 0 0.0821. So congratulations, you just made a ruler of gas. Thank you. Okay, a ruler of gas. Like a ruler, like a ruler. Yeah, imagine you had to make one out of the blue. Like a ruler never existed, ruler. and you had to measure something. <laughs> there we go. And by the way, the rest of this is nothing but terms. So I'm just going to knock out all these terms that you're going to have to run into in definitions. Uh, by the way, don't forget to know, uh, going back, what a barometer, what a manometer is, all that kind of stuff. Those are some terms we talked about earlier. Those are going to be on the test. This will be on the test too. What is the difference between diffusion and effusion? Okay. Uh, there is a difference. Diffusion you're more familiar with because basically imagine an aerosol can and uh, you let out all the air. Effusion is basically like leaking, okay? So imagine you have a hole in your tire, like you ran over a nail, and gas is slowly coming out of it. That's effusion. It's basically how gas particles get through very tiny microscopic holes. By the way, have you ever figured out why you have a balloon and all of a sudden the air goes out of it eventually? Yes. That's not diffusion. That's effusion. In other words, you didn't pop it. You're not leaking it out. You just have a blown up balloon that you got for your birthday. You come back a month later and it's deflated. The reason why is gas particles are bouncing around until they get through that little teeny tiny hole and make its way out. Therefore, less pressure and then it diffuses. Or, I'm sorry, effuses. Uh, diffusion, however, is basically like an aerosol can. It, gases move apart as much as they can. A lot like y'all at the end of the school day, as soon as you're out the door, you're gone. Okay? Uh, I would say a diffusion is a lot like a tire, except imagine the tire exploding. Instead of leaking, imagine it popped. Okay? So that's the big difference between the two. So here's diffusion. They start at very concentrated side, and as uh, they get more room, they're able to go uh, get far apart until they, uh, what we call is uh, equilibrium, which is great because it's basically everybody balancing out. You know, they just don't want to be so close to each other. Uh, I would do more of the terms, uh, but a picture does help out. I say imagine the picture because that really does help the difference. Um, effusion, just like I said, say, it's, it's, they're almost identical. It's just effusion has to deal with just leaking rather than, you know, all at once. Uh, very, very slow effusion is, and diffusion is very, very quick. Thanks. All right, next thing. Wait for that to disappear. All right, so, oh, okay, here we go. This is not a problem, but this is uh, basically you guessing. So imagine we have a one balloon in the lab filled with hydrogen gas, another balloon filled with helium, another one filled with oxygen. They are all placed in separate balloons under ideal conditions. Are y'all paying attention in the front? Yes. Okay. Predict what the balloons will look like in a few days. So they're going to effuse, okay, they're going to leak. But now, are they all going to be the same size or are they all going to be different? Oh, you stink. Okay, yeah. All right, so Whit figured it out before I had time to make you think all this kind of stuff. So what would happen is this. This is helium, that's hydrogen, and that's oxygen. Explain to me why they're all different sizes. They're all different. I just said. I know you did. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to get a drink. All right, so oxygen. What's the mass of oxygen? O2. 32. Okay. What is the mass of helium? And no, helium is not diatomic, so it's just... No, not 2.02. 4.4. 4.04. Hydrogen, Hydrogen, or H2, is 2.02. So note this, 32, uh, 4.04, uh, 4.04, I'm at 4.01, whatever you call it, and then this one is 2.02. Imagine that. Look at that. Their masses means the different rate of effusion. So in other words, the bigger the molecule is, the harder it is to get it through that little tiny microscopic hole. And that makes sense. Things that are tinier, though, are going to be able to get through that hole a little bit quicker. So that's one way to kind of look at it depending on their size. So basically, bigger gas molecules have a harder time effusing because they're bigger. Uh, smaller ones can get out a lot easier. That's pretty much it. Is that so? That is so.
Yeah. Now, I do realize they were all filled up, all same volume, same temperature, in the same room. They just had different rates of effusion. Okay? That actually helps the effusion part a little bit better because that's one reason why you got to know that. Any questions on that? Makes sense, right? The bigger you are, the harder you are to diffuse. That's pretty much it. You're right, because they're bigger. They can't make it through that hole. All right, so how else can you see things on your test? Well, I like this. This goes back to unit one. So from left to right on your, if you did print out your notes, you have this little chart. Uh, so what you got to do is this. We're going to compare gas, liquids, and solids, not just in terms of shape and size or volume. We're now going to add in pressure and all this other kind of stuff to it. Okay? So as you go from left to right, I'm going to cover each one of these guys. Uh, the first one's going to be gas, the second one's going to be liquid, and the bottom one's going to be solid. Okay? So we're doing them as you go from left to right. So first off, if we were to compare compressibility, or how much can we compress things, Gases are very compressible because there's a lot of space. Liquids and solids are not. If you tried pushing in on a solid and a liquid, they don't want, they, you know, they're already kind of too close together. But gases, you can squeeze them, squish them. Uh, they, they can be compressed. Very, very compressible. That's good. The only problem is they have a high pressure, unlike liquids and solids. Uh, next one, density. If you compare, you'll notice that there's going to be a similarity between liquids and solids. Okay, this is one reason why we're, it's easier to do, study these two than a gas. Gases have very low density. That's why they're lighter than the air. That's why a lot of them float. It's hard to actually see them because of their density or because that they're not very compact together. We can see liquids and solids because they're very compact together. Um, that's pretty much it for there. The density does have something to relate back to compressibility. Volume. We already did this. This is back in unit one. Gases fill their container. They have no definite volume. However, liquids and solids, they both have a definite volume. Guess what the next one's going to be? What? If we did volume. Pressure. No, nope, we already did pressure. That's compressibility. Temperature. No. Is it an elephant? No definite blank, but no definite volume. Shape. There you go. So shape. It, contain, it, is, it contains. It assumes the shape of its container. No definite shape. Um, However, this is one thing gases do have a relationship with another uh, state of matter, liquids. They assume the shape of their container too. That's why they're called liquids. Okay, so this makes sense. Rapid diffusion. Gases are going to try to spread out as quick as they can. Liquids, they have very slow rate of diffusion. They're not going to get away from each other very fast, but they are not, the, you know, they're not as fast as gases, but they're slow compared to gases. Solids are extremely slow, like iceberg glacier slow. And very next one to the last, high expansion when heated, uh, the other guys, low expansion. So you'll notice there is only one thing that gases have relation to to another compound, and that's the shape. That's only with liquids. Everything else is big different. It's like one-sided, like these two are very different from this. This is why we have this unit. It's because of the he does not do what everybody else does. There is technically a fourth state of matter which we have excluded. We've just turned it into a, a, just another subscript of a gas called plasma. It's just a really, really hot glass. Gas, gas, not glass. Really, really hot, like, like super hot. All right, next thing, some properties of liquids. Viscosity. Ooh. Viscosity. People get this mixed up with, uh, well, they, they think it backwards, okay? Think of syrup versus water. Which one's going to flow faster? Water. Okay. And which one's going to flow slower? Water. Syrup. Okay. Uh, most people think it has to do with the texture, but did I, what if I told you you can make syrup flow just like water? So how to make this flow real fast is this. If you take just a regular Angel Mama or whatever, if you use that or whatever syrup you use, um, if it doesn't already flow real fast, all you got to do is heat it up. Okay. Which makes sense. Don't make burn it. But if you high, increase the temperature, the viscosity is actually going to lower. So viscosity has to do more with flow. Okay? Up. Right. So lower viscosity um, basically happens at, uh, okay, it means resistance is basically what it means. Okay? So to overcome that, you just need to speed things up a little bit. It's kind of like giving you all a little bit of pep in your step. 
Okay, so a higher temperature, the lower viscosity because the molecules speed up and overcome the attractive forces more easily. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so here's a picture, okay? Uh, let's compare these two. No, it's not like you're mixing them together and eating them. So, looking at these two guys, if I were to ask you on the test, ketchup versus peanut butter, which one, okay, has a higher viscosity? Peanut butter. Are you sure? Yes, because it resists this emotion. All right, good. All right. <laughs> so the ketchup has a lower viscosity, and the peanut butter has a higher viscosity. Okay. So lower viscosity is because the molecules speed up and overcome the attractive forces. All right. Um, if we did, however, t uh, heat up that peanut butter, what's going to happen to it? It's going to go. It's going to be easier. To it's going to be easier to flow. Yeah. If you ever had uh, put do some toast. Before you make a PB and J, put the uh, but peanut butter on the warm toast. It's gonna flow a lot better. If you've never had the peanut butter burger, it's actually good. I know it sounds disgusting, but if you like peanut butter, it is delicious. So what is this stuff down here? Y'all know what? Uh, not mothballs, but you know what moth crystals are. It's an alternative to mothballs, the little chalky balls that you see people put around that stink. That's all right, that is called paradichlorobenzene, or AKA PDB. Um, it's basically a molecule that it's solid at room temperature. But if you heat it up, it flows just like water, and that's what this is down here. No. The more heat you add, the quicker it flows. No. See? No. See? Yeah. All right, so it stays the matter. Let's go ahead and knock this out. This is going to be quick and easy, guys. Uh, these are some more terms you got to know, but. Uh, vaporization. Many people don't realize this, but evaporate and boiling are not the same thing. You're like, what? Okay. Evaporate has to deal with the surface of the liquid. Okay. Boiling has to deal with beneath the surface. So water boils, but after it gets out of the pot and it's in the air, it's evaporating. So yeah, they do talk about the same thing, but they're two different things. They're kind of like siblings from the same family, the terms are. Uh, they both mean vaporization, but there's two types. So when we talk about the surface to, of the liquid right up here, evaporating below the surface, it's boiling. No, no, it's all about uh, where you're referring to. So if you go backwards, you have something called condensation. Condensation. By the way, if you look very closely, you can see a smiley face. There's an eye, there's an eye, there's a nose, there's a smile. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. And then again, you might blur your eyes and see a rabbit. I don't know. Freezing and, uh, I'm sorry, condensation, going from gas to liquid, liquid to gas. You do need to know what those terms are. Uh, next one up, and then we talked about this already, okay, and this is probably the best question I could give you, okay? If you learn something, it'll be this. Freezing is going from liquid to solid, and melting is from solid to liquid. However, if I tell you the freezing point of water is zero degrees C, what is the melting point of water? Zero degrees C. It is the same number. Wait, Why? The, degree. the freeze and the melting are both zero degrees C. They are at the same point. Because they're in transition. It depends which direction you're going. Yeah, man. Right on, bro. So it's a lot like the crossroads. If you're standing in the middle of the crossroads, you could go one way or the other. All right? So basically, zero degree C is the crossroad. You're standing right there. If you go to negative side, you're going to go more towards free, uh, melt, no, freezing. I said it right the first time. And if you go above zero degree C, you're going to go more to the uh, melting. So if you stay at zero degree C, you'll be at this state of matter where you're both. All right, so we covered freezing, melting. We covered uh, boiling and condensation. So we did the forwards and backwards of both of those states. So that leaves some of these other guys. Um, and I think I sum them up a little bit differently here. Okay. Oh, here we go. This is what you need right here. No. Um, so, uh, when you see the word enthalpy, uh, it basically has to do with the energy in the system. So, if you increase the energy, in other words, the heat, this is what happens. You go from solid to liquid, but you can also skip the liquid phase go right to the gas. We covered these two. We covered these two. By the way, fusion is actually the same thing as melting. Uh, you can skip the state of matter. If you go from a solid to a gas, you sublimate. Okay, and if you go from a gas to a solid, uh, you don't condensate, you deposite. 
deposition. Okay, so terms that you got to know, let's talk about those last two. Sublimation, solid to gas, example, dry ice. It's solid carbon dioxide. But when you drop it, and you'll notice it makes a little fog. This is what Ozzy used to use for his stage lights to make fog appear. Okay, now we have fog machines. But before then, they just did dry ice. Deposition, gas to solid. Example there is snow and not John Snow. This last little bit basically explains some of the other kind of stuff. Um, look at the temperature here. 100 degrees C is where it boils. Okay, oops, sorry. Uh, and a zero degree C is where it freezes. So the point, if we stay at zero, we are both ice and water. We're slushy, okay? If we go above that temperature, like one degree C, we start moving towards liquid. If we go below that, we stay freezing. Um, so same thing up here. If you stay at 100 degrees C, you're going between water and steam. You're both. You're not different. You're at the same part. So notice that there is 100 degrees between changing the state of matter of water. Pure water, not water with salt in it, obviously. Um, and that's pretty much all I got to say about that. So what that does back down to is this one little joke. Um, some people say, I told you cold does not exist. Okay, so when somebody says, hey, you know, let the, uh, shut the do window or shut the door, you're letting the cold air in, uh, you can smack them and say second law of thermodynamics. Cold does not exist. Heat goes out. That's how it works.